You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to cyborg anthropologist Amber Case. Calm technology is the idea that the scarce resource in the 21st century is not technology, it's our attention. And how technology takes advantage or not of our attention is something that we can change. Amber shared her thoughts on new forms of interaction between humans and computers, how we can design with sound, and the emerging field of calm technology. This episode was recorded on location in London, England, where Amber was due to give a keynote presentation. So Amber, I know you as the cyborg anthropologist. I mean, what was cyborg anthropology? Cyborg anthropology is a subsection of the anthropology of science. The idea behind it is to study how technology affects culture and how humans co-create each other with our external objects. And what work were you doing in that space? So I remember you gave the very well-known talk, uh, we're all cyborgs now. Do you still believe that we're all cyborgs now? Or do you think there's something more nuanced going on? Of course we're all cyborgs now. We don't have to be Terminator or Robocop. These ideas that we have in our head aesthetically of these military machines and uh, come from film. Because originally we had humans versus nature. It is a pretty easy narrative to show in a play. You could have a tornado, you could have a rainstorm, you could have ambient sounds. But once we had the Industrial Revolution, it was man versus machine. How do you show that on stage? How do you show that in film? Well, you need to make a robot in the shape of a human and have them fight on the screen. And that's where we got the idea of robots, Rosum's robots. And we had early on in The Wizard of Oz, we had all these like machine man. The Wizard of Oz is kind of this science fiction idea of the industrial man, the tin woodman. Does he have a heart? Does the scarecrow have a brain? He's the farmer in, in, in America in that time. And then this was written in 1901. So it's this kind of science fiction idea of the transition from agriculture to the Industrial Revolution. What does that mean? How are things shaped over time? Uh, where are we? And what's the future for us? So you were saying back when you gave this presentation that the mere relationship between us and our mobile devices makes us cyborgs. Yeah, that we've been cyborgs since we started externalizing our evolution outside of ourselves. So for instance, a hammer is an extension of our fist, a knife, an extension of our teeth, and then cave paintings, an extension of our brain. We had these kind of stable extensions of our physical selves. A hammer hasn't really changed size or shape or function over the last few million years. And yet Writing has certainly changed shape. It's it's changed size. It's changed carrier. It's changed from the printing press over to sending something over the airwaves, sending something over computers. And so this externalization has increased in acceleration. And often what we think is the norm, everybody having a cell phone in their pockets, for instance, that was not the norm 15 years ago. And even if it was, it was for business people or it didn't have a camera in it. It wasn't this multi sensory device that we now have, these these multi-external sensors. And the word cyborg actually comes from a 1960 paper on space travel in which we attach exogenous components to ourselves for the purpose of adapting to new ambient spaces. Basically, somebody in a spacesuit is the ultimate cyborg. Humans are not supposed to be in space. But when they are in space, they're able to survive because of these feedback loop mechanisms. A lot of this information came from the Macy meetings in the 40s. And in the 1940s, these anthropologists and technologists got together and said, at some point, technology will get smaller and smaller and be part of our everyday lives. What's going to happen at that point in time? We've lost some concepts like in cybernetics of the feedback loop, yet those are the most successful automated systems that we have today. They're not, hey, we're our own ecosystem outside of ourselves. We're humans and not nature. It's the idea of a human and a computer working alongside each other in a feedback loop improving the results, improving the complexity of the system. That feedback loop that gets better over time is much more of a natural system than saying, oh, we have the solution, here's a black box of AI, just throw it at your company and everything will be fine. We're looking at Facebook and, and Gmail auto reply. There's these Gmail suggestions now where you have three items where it says, oh, you know, should I say yes, thank you very much, or sounds good, that you can just use to start your email it's not trying to respond entirely for you, and it's giving you choices, because the moment a machine gives you choice and you pick 
a specific choice, it's improving that mechanism over time. That feedback is incredibly important. And that's some of the things that we've lost when we say robots will take over the world and they'll make all of our decisions for us. Unless we're going back to that poem that says, and the future will be a cybernetic dreamland all watched over by machines of love and grace, where we had from the from the 60s in San Francisco, these ideas of the augmentation of self. We don't really have that as much anymore. We have Weren't we promised a future in which we reached a technological complexity that was so good that we wouldn't have to work anymore, that we'd have more free time, yet our devices are more media consumption devices now, and it kind of expands like a gas to fill all of the available social space that we have? We were promised some excess of time, more reflection, amplifying what what machines do best so that we, we could have our own version of art. Yet people want to automate everything. Do you want to automate hanging out with your kids? Do you want to automate a sunset? Do you want to automate enjoying somebody's wedding? No, absolutely not. Yet with this automation culture, people are fearful of it taking over absolutely everything. So when do you think we lost some of that agency over the sort of future that we want to live in? It seems, at least to me, that we're given these very defined, very uh, limited options of how we can B, how do we demand more options rather than demand less and be given less only because that makes us more easy to understand as robotic entities rather than human entities? I do feel like a lot of us are on pause and just turn into data, basically, for the purposes of, oh, you're this kind of data shape? This article on Facebook will make you angry. And when you're angry, you will click more on this site stay longer, and we'll get our advertising revenue. We can trace this all back to publicly traded companies that are required to grow over time, 3 to 5%, even more. They have to keep saturating and making sure that there's new markets. Why else would Facebook want to go into Africa and give people Wi-Fi unless there was some economic incentive for them? Once you reach market saturation, you have to keep going. How do you keep going? Well, with Google, if you do a self-driving car, you might get 30% more time on Google when somebody's in a car because they don't have to drive, right? It's opening up time. But the idea of a publicly traded company working as an entity with its own rules outside of humans, that is an algorithm. That's a program. That's AI, And what people don't understand right now is I I think we're already in a world of of AI. We already have plenty of search engine robots that give us suggestions of results that we choose from. But we as individuals are governed by these systems that are no longer just governments. They're actual multinational corporations. And if you don't do well in this corporation, somebody else will take your place. Because people are now in situations where living is so expensive that they have to work. And there's really not a lot of other options. If you go independent, then you end up getting sponsored by these large companies. If we look at Generation Like, there's no longer the idea of selling out. Selling out used to be horrible. Now you want corporate sponsorship. Now, oh, I I became a Tommy Hilfinger model. This is amazing, right? And all of your friends are, oh, I'm so supportive of you. That's fantastic. You don't have the punks being like... Oh, you sold out, man. What the hell? <laughs> so dumb. The, the goal of a YouTube star or an Instagram star is to get that brand sponsorship. They're, they're almost courting the the original systems of control. Absolutely. I mean, they're they're shaping themselves to look like the advertisements that, that have been given to them so that they can work in that industry. And the, the issue is that how long does that last? How long do you get as a YouTube celebrity? How long are you able to buy the newest aesthetic? Are you buying pre-worn items so that there's a sense of authenticity? Or are you actually building these items yourself? A lot of these subcultures now are just purchasing the aesthetics to get into them and forgetting the ideas behind it and the philosophies behind it that led those aesthetics to show up in the first place. So do you think to a degree our, our drive to optimize the interface has actually left something behind in terms of aesthetics? It feels like those systems are designed to have a certain sort of user experience and the only aesthetic cues inside of those systems are there to help us click more or engage more or stop and pause and consume more. I would say Facebook is is definitely an industrial spreadsheet game. We're all just database animals looking at row one, column three, and plus one like, plus one comment. Ah, this is great. I, I have I have the equivalent of of social grooming, you know, externally, and it's attached to all the feedback loops in my brain that give me dopamine. Even though nobody is actually touching my hair, I feel as if I am close to somebody, and my value is intertwined 
temporarily with this. And that becomes weird because it means that we're in this very, the time slice of our culture is, is these tiny, tiny pieces of time instead of this longer term time. We don't have the idea of working on something for 10 years and having that grow over time. Because if you do, you end up seeing the output or placing the output on something like Reddit and then people are consuming it. And within seconds, it can be exciting or go away and you have to capture that value immediately and hold on to it for as long as you can. But if you, if you go back to Doug Rushkoff's original Merchants of Cool, the idea of this this Ouroboros, this feedback loop, this snake eating its tail is that the minute a uh, larger society and these large companies find out what's cool and sell it back to people, then it becomes uncool. Oddly enough, I think we're seeing something a little bit new where the companies are figuring out what's cool and they're selling it back to them and they're also producing what's cool. But the coolness is staying firmly rooted in the company and the consumers are actually participating in that feedback culture a little bit more instead of it being, oh, it's it's horrible now that it's been co-opted by a company. It's, oh, now it's a celebration of that company and now I appreciate that company more. I, I think there's a little bit of a brand special thing where you want to be part of these brands and like come home to them and they're providing you more meaning in your life than maybe your family or your friends or you're making friends through these these feedback loops and you're getting sold this thing back to you but it's okay now to a degree we want to go back to something that's comfortable or calm and that's something in our childhood it feels like there's no responsibility anymore or millennials have no responsibility for their own action therefore they rely on brands to tell them what to do and then that feedback loop self-reinforces the fact that they're doing the right thing i've been thinking about this a lot because well i played pokemon early on and I traded Pokemon cards. And I and I I was a little bit older than the demographic because I got introduced to it really early through a Japanese friend. And I played it in Japanese on a Game Boy. And then I got to play the English version. So I was a little bit older because I was the target demographic just uh, a few years before I came to the States. And then I would go to like Toys R Us and do the Pokemon trading card game and all these things. It was really fun. But I think there's something going on where for the most part... Living is very expensive. People have to hold two jobs now. There's massive student debt because we've all been told that we need to go to college. Uh, thankfully, I knew early on that I would have massive student debt, so I tried to get as many scholarships as I could. I graduated in 2008 in the States, which is just career suicide. How are you supposed to build something? So I had to build something from scratch, and it was a lot of just survival for 10 years. I didn't get to have a silly time in, in college. I didn't get to have a silly time in my 20s. It was all work. Because I thought if I didn't do that, I had nothing else and I wouldn't survive. And I just couldn't be saddled with all this debt because my parents, you know, were in debt too. And so I didn't, I didn't want to live like that again. I was so upset about that. But you have a, a group of people and you can see this in Japan where what's the option? Either you work, you can never afford a house and it's really difficult to afford a family and you have no support and then you're not even going to have retirement. Why even do anything? So if you go back to a period of time in which you didn't have those worries and things are more stable, Pokemon's fantastic. Suddenly it reintroduces you to your neighborhood and you have a reason to go outside. In a culture in which you're living in a condo and you don't know anybody in your neighborhood because there's no reason to do so, how many people stay in a place for long enough to know their neighbors and are within walking distance of everything? And if you are, you're paying so much for your condo or flat or apartment that you don't have any time to be there. So suddenly you can go outside and everybody's connected to each other. And of course, the game is still doing quite well. It's just the platform it was built on, Ingress, has a number of issues. First, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you can't get to all the Pokestops because they stopped developing more Pokestops. And there were a lot of a lot of issues with like nearby Pokemon and things like that. So we had this amazing summer where everybody was on the same page. You could talk to anybody in the city because everybody was playing Pokemon. That was really cool. But you kind of see this nostalgia for something where things were a little bit simpler. People have these memories. It was a stable period of time. Or there was this special culture that you had that you can go back to. But I was also thinking, like, what happened to music? Where are all the new musical movements? Where are we experiencing change? You know, there's experimental music and things like that. But where are we really pushing the boundaries? Because a lot of the people who would have maybe made garage bands, gone over to band practice at like 16 or 15 or whatever, the minute you get like a learner's permit, you're driving to somebody's house or they're in your neighborhood and you're bringing your equipment over and you're doing band practice. All of those people are preparing for school for college, they're in tons of extracurricular activities, or they're in a city 
where there's not enough room to have a two car garage to do something like that, or they're, they're not getting their learner's permit or their driving permit until later because everything's been geographically distributed and all of their friends don't live close enough. And so it's easier to just connect to them through mobile devices. So there's a lot of different things going on right now. I think that just the aesthetics of the 90s is like, oh, this is great. Well, I can I can buy these clothes and I can be in this in this state and have a fun time because what else am I going to do? What what does an adult look like today? How can you be one? What does it even mean? How can you own your own house? The researcher Simon Reynolds calls that, especially with music, calls that retromania. And I just wonder if we're caught in a feedback loop that's inescapable. There is no new anymore. We've realized that, yes, technology may work by Moore's law, but culture doesn't. Culture stays very much the same. Culture doesn't have that same exponential change built into it because culture is reliant on us humans. Although we did see culture change a lot, for instance, Queen Elizabeth's outfits in the 1600s and the advent of sumptuary law. Uh, if, if you look at that period of time, you had merchant class becoming more successful than the crown and having more money, more disposable income. So Queen Elizabeth implemented su sumptuary law, which was the, the idea of you can't wear a skirt this long. You can't have this many ruffles. You can't wear this color as a way of taxing the up and coming merchant class and a way of distinguishing the crown from these new merchants. And so there was this massive growth in all of these different textiles and items to wear. And, it, and if you look at the the clothing back then, it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, but we kind of see that now with a kind of fractal aesthetic. We have these, these interfaces and these changes that are just aesthetic and they're happening at this kind of fractal level where it's like a thing within a thing within a thing within a thing is changing. And all of it doesn't mean anything at all. But it means so much because it's within this subculture that I'm following on Instagram and it's within that, within that, within that. And it's like, you even see it with like, you know, jackets. You have like, oh, here's a jean jacket. But then there's these patches. And then within those patches, there's this thing. And then within that, you know, or there's jeans. Now it's not just blue jeans. It's many different kinds of jeans. And so you have to have all of them, you know. It's, it's this funny thing that's happening where like the surfaces are getting complex and then emptying out again. I don't know entirely what to make of it. It's just that... We have lots and lots of options and we're all expected to be very good at these options. But when I walk down the street anymore, I don't see people making wild fashion decisions anymore. I see a very conservative, very global aesthetic consumptive pattern that is consistent almost everywhere I go, where you just have this kind of normalization of culture and whoever pushes that aesthetic really hard in terms of like norm core gets these giant Instagram accounts, <laughs> but it's not them saying, Oh, look at this weird thing that I made. And you know, you don't have these punk bands that have just made these incredible risks and they're super weird. Like where are the weirdos? Where is the, the nineties and two thousands aesthetic of your know, cyberpunk where this stuff happened from scratch and we were making new weird sounds. Like where are the new sounds? Like where is David Bowie showing up saying, oh, there's this new synthesizer thing that, that Brian Eno is trying out, or, oh, wow, there's all these people in, in Brooklyn that are making this insane sound with their voices. Like, I want to get in on that. Like, where is that happening? I mean, you look at things like Tune Yards and, and you have um, you have Grimes that's doing super weird stuff, you know, but it's so digital. You know, it's, it's somebody sampling something or recording something in a closet in a hotel room and sending it to somebody else. You know, they're not even, you know, you do see this, like some French artists who are taking all these analog instruments and jamming out and you get these things. But again, they're not new sounding really at all. Could that be just uh, to go back to cyborgs, could that just be a limit of the human senses? So the cyborg artist, Neil Harbisson, he's a colorblind artist who has an antenna that allows him to hear color. It vibrates his skull and through bone conduction, he has this new sense. It's not quite hearing, but it's a new sense. And he's able to convert pre-existing songs into these soundscapes. Now, as an individual who might not be wearing or have an antenna embedded into their skull, we may only be able to experience that musical art piece visually. We may only be able to see the colors. And I wonder, 
whether we've reached a plateau of the human senses and now to tip over to the next new, we're going to have to start manipulating our own bodies for the ability to hear ultrasound. And that might be a new aesthetic experience. I wonder what your thoughts on on that are, that extreme sort of cyborg who remolds their senses for a new aesthetic experience. I'm a real big fan of Neil Harbison and also Moon Rebus because they're using the concept of synesthesia. They're saying, well, if I can't experience this one sound or this one color, I'll transform it into a different sense and then my brain will remap and I'll be able to feel that in a new way. And Moon Rebus has the earthquake sensors. So whenever earthquakes are happening, she can feel them. I, I love that, you know. So there's this idea that you can just add another sense onto you. And perhaps that's a way to go. I mean, the the difference is that when you're producing music, like a lot of the popular music today is like a lot of electronic music because you can't hear the full range when it's compressed down over streaming on Spotify through your earbuds when you're on public transportation or a plane and you're in a 95 decibel environment. What do you hear? You hear some of the drums and you hear some of the really sharp synths. So to make music that sounds good with all that background noise, when people aren't using noise canceling headphones or like sitting in a really nice living room or dining room showing people music or like sitting on some shag carpet that's like absorbing all the reverb, like, well, it's a completely different experience. You're not taking time to listen to a song and, and putting a memory with it. You're just consuming information, which is why like podcasts are becoming really great. And like ambient music is becoming like a really big deal because now people are in these non-places a lot of time, a non-place that which Mark Ogier described as something where you're a human on pause. You have no relation to anybody else, no identity and no history, like an airport, a shopping mall, a dentist's office, a commute. That's these places where like we need to feel like there's some humans around. And so even in, when we're in those non-places, we put on some ambient music or a podcast and make us feel like there's something there to give us some relation to something else, to give us some history. And so this becomes these things where we're just trying to have something with us so that we're not so, I mean, these, these spaces were given to us from industrial time, right? We got really stretched out and geography didn't matter as much, but we as humans got put on pause a lot. So I feel like there's a whole new genre that might have been considered like nerd music before of, of ambient spaces or, you know, more harsh experimental stuff that is kind of pushing the boundaries. There's more than just instruments in it, but lots of sounds sampled from the environment. I like to wonder a lot about when we go to Mars, because we're going to have to, we're going to have to go to another planet. And, and it's sad that people laugh about saying we're going to space like that was not a joke in the 60s like that was a big deal even though it was for military purposes it's a really important thing to do but i'm wondering when you're you know you're going up and it takes 30 days to get to mars or whatever and you're gonna have to do something to keep yourself company you'll pr people will probably make a bunch of music and it's going to be sampling like the weirdest space noises like how long will these songs be what will they feel like will they give people Right now, the, the songs are like, okay, this is giving you some like joy or it's giving you some sadness or it's about heartbreak. But what about the music that gives you a sense of emptiness or like a sense of discomfort? Like what about all the different senses? You know, there, there's just a lot to explore. And I think there's a kind of idea of safety. We're just going to make a pop hit. Then we're going to make a pop hit with some 90s stuff in it. Then we're going to use the synthesizer pattern from the specific synthesizer that everybody loves but I would encourage people to look at, just go on Spotify and look up body shame. It's a, it's just like pushing these boundaries. And when you watch it live, it's you know, everybody standing in front of an amp, putting earplugs in and feeling the sound. is like a sonic massage, but it, like you can feel it all over your body. And weirdly enough, it's not the kind of music where it's like, I'm going to think over this music. It's like it wipes out all of your mental processes and you just go into a state of flow. It's just like, bam, you know, there's that, there's, there's binaural audio, like there's all sorts of different things you can do. And the book that I'm working on right now with my co-author, Aaron Day, some of that's about what happens in the environment. Like if you take a decibel meter and you find out how noisy everything is and how that builds up on you over time, you'll go to your favorite coffee shop and say, it's really hard for me to work in here. I like the energy of the people, but the background noise is really loud because this kind of romantic industrial movement where we have these very concrete spaces and there's no soft stuff makes the sound reverberate all around the room. 
And that actually wears on you over time. And you can get super overwhelmed by these noisy environments. Whereas some of these cozier spaces, you know, you go to your grandma's house, it's really cozy. You know, it's all this soft plush carpet. It doesn't look as great, but it feels really nice, you know? So we forget that we process our spaces so visually that we forget that sound is part of how something feels and we can improve these spaces over time. And there's, there's so many different opportunities that we're missing because we're so focused on the visual channel and just trying to block stuff out versus, you know, you sh- everybody should have noise canceling headphones, like especially for plane trips. It, the amount of exhaustion that I experience after eight hours on a plane with noise canceling headphones and without, I didn't realize, I thought it was me just sitting there that was annoying, but it was actually my brain processing all the background sound the whole time. My ears aren't shutting off. And that just wears me down over time. It's just excess energy that I don't need to spend. Do you think there's a fear of silence? The only time that we can have silence, we need to be guided through that silence. In other words, it's meditation. So we need a meditative app or we need a meditation guru or a yoga guru to kind of help us deal with silence. And then when we have extreme examples of silence, people can't spend more than, I think it's 15 to 20 minutes in there without going absolutely insane. I would encourage everyone to read essays and look at John Cage's work on silence because it's fun. First off, you look at the the kind of friends he had around that time and what they were talking about and how they were experimenting and how they were visualizing these different environments and their experimental work. That's really exciting. And what is silence? There's no real thing as silence unless you go out into space and then you just have no molecular movement. I've been in these anechoic chambers uh, at Bell Labs, at Sonos, at all these different companies. And yeah, you go into them and you can hear the blood pumping in your ears. And I, and I like them. You know, they're, they're great. But again, your brain is used to processing input. And if there's nothing there, it's weird. And as you get back into the real world after 20 minutes in that, everything feels really loud and choppy. Like imagine right before you're going to sleep, before your ears kind of turn off, everything gets like kind of like weird and loud and distant. Or if you're really, really tired, everything like just seems really sharp and jarring. That's what it's like to go out of one of those chambers after you've had like no input for a while. There's those little baths where it's, it's sensory deprivation tanks so that your brain is used to creating or processing something. So you end up hallucinating these things and going internal. It's interesting that we have to go through this guided stuff in order to be silent. Versus, you know, you could just wake up at dawn or stay up until dawn and watch the sunrise. There's silence for you. It's not real silence, not John Cage silence, you know. But you do get this this sense of slowness and this sense of reflective time. I think this is a good point to bring up the idea of, of the Greek concept of kairos and chronos time. Chronos time being a more industrial time, the scheduled time of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it must be this time and I have to do this thing right now and my taxes are due on this date. And then there's the Kairos time, which is, oh my gosh, after three years, I realized that my mom had this ring and, and it was given to me by this person. And oh, wow, this, this is a special moment. Or like, these are the last days I have with my dad. You know, these like super, you can't program those. You can't expect those. You can't automate those. And I think oftentimes we have this kind of simultaneous time zones on our phone where we get interrupted by all these different people from living their own different times, sending us messages, not knowing whether we're available for that or not. I put my phone in airplane mode to prevent this, by the way, so I can choose my time. But when you have all of that going on, when do you have time for reflection? If I'm writing, I don't need to write in a publicly available journal. I can write in my notebook. Where's the diaries? It's not a diary generation. The minute we went on to live journal, it's like, oh, I'm going to publish these thoughts for people to see. Oh, I'm feeling bad. I'll post on Instagram and get some likes. No, 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 no. What about the feedback loop with yourself to further strengthen who you are and understand like something over time and build up those thoughts? Like people need more of that. We, we also need things where people are like, we need work-life balance. It's like, well, sometimes when you're really passionate about something, you put all of your effort into it and that should be fine, you know, but you should be able to be in more flow states without interruption. I think this is some of the misunderstanding inside of virtual reality at the moment. The, the last four or five discussions that I have had about VR have all been about how does VR make us more empathetic with each other? But in actual fact, I think the real power is to make us more empathetic with ourselves. See, the crazy thing about the Facebook feed is that you see everybody else's life, but you never really consume your own. That's correct. That's why I've installed a bunch of Chrome filters. I have Gmail inbox when ready. It shows me nothing until I click show inbox. So the minute I log into my Gmail, it's just a search feature. 
and I can search for the message. So I'm not interrupting my time. You know, you can look at Tristan Harris's time well spent movement for more plugins. It's really useful, but one of them is for Facebook. It's it just doesn't show me a newsfeed, and I actually can't post the newsfeed. <laughs> it's great, and so if I really want to, I can do it. And I can click some buttons. It shows me a motivational quote instead, or something that I can reflect on. But it's fun because you can actually kind of change your experience of these things by adding plugins and really understanding your, your relation to things. Um, and it's not that I don't want to see a generation of people like, oh, I need some reflective time. See ya. Like, don't do stuff like that. You know, oh, I'm sorry. I needed more reflect. No. OK. Yes, you can process and you can do all these things. I don't want it to turn into some like super me movement. It would just be nice to have some time where you don't have to be producing your identity external to yourself for the consumption of robots and other humans and likes. And some, oh, I don't feel really great today. And that's fine. You don't need to tell everybody about it. You know, you don't need to make it a big deal. Like, it's just, okay, some days are good. Some days are bad. I'm human. I don't need to be on like a billion antidepressants to be okay with that. Some people do. There are chemical imbalances based on industrial society that are difficult to avoid. But also giving ourselves a little bit of a break and being nicer to ourselves and saying, oh, it's okay. I overreacted to that thing because of this thing. Hmm. I know myself a little bit more to do that. Or... I'm feeling bad, so instead of taking it out on somebody else, I'll draw a cartoon about it. I mean, there are these kind of old methods, or I just need some time to stare into nothingness. Great. Like, you don't have to have a meditative movement or a $75 a month yoga subscription to do that. Like, you could just take that time. Like, I can just zonk right out on a plane. I can be in the most stressful, crowded situation and just turn inward and go into a state of flow and just be super cozy. Uh, which is why I like New York. Like New York is full of those spaces. It's just like, I'm just super chilled out. I don't care what's going on, you know, but it's taken a long time to get there. It's kind of like turning airplane mode on in your own brain. <laughs> and so it's like when you used to be on a plane and there wasn't Wi-Fi, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have nothing to do. I'm going to rearrange all of the desktop icons and like clean up my files. We need a lot more of that. I think there was this Rick and Morty episode that a lot of people loved about Pickle Rick. This grandpa doesn't want to hang out with his family and like go to the stupid therapy appointment because he's way too smart for that. He's this genius scientist. So he turns himself literally into a pickle and gets himself into an actual pickle of a situation and finally shows up on the therapist's couch and is like, fuck you, I hate therapy and therapy's the worst. And the woman's like, yeah, of course, like therapy is way beneath you. You don't need any of this stuff. But... There's this thing in life called maintenance and it's not this great adventure and it's not packaged and sold back to you and it's not shiny and it doesn't have all these likes on Facebook. It's the idea of putting your bed back together and like maintaining family relationships is that boring stuff. And the problem with the constant production of identity and value and culture is that we miss all of those things when we hyper produce ourselves and we forget that half of it's that maintenance and it's not sexy. It's, you know, going to the freaking dentist, you know, it's it's hugging somebody and telling them that you appreciate them. It's hanging out with somebody when they're feeling bad or being in moments in which people are boring. Fine, you know? And those things don't work well on Instagram. They don't work well on Facebook unless it's a supermodel that says, look, I'm without makeup and I'm really tired. Okay, great. But you already had 14 million followers. And there's been some people that have done this that actually behind the scenes, my life looks horrible. It's full of non-places and I hate it but I'm always producing these things for you and you're getting the the misconstrued notion of my actual life. So I think we just need to be like, okay, we're human. We need a break. Just like our phone needs to charge, we need to recharge as well. And if we're doing things that don't mean anything over time, it's usually because we're consuming more than we create. And that's really hard to change because on the early web, you didn't have to have one stable full name identity. You know, you could be fluid in your identity and just be a person made of text on a forum and be super clever or not, you know, based on whatever you were doing and have some time to research. And then you could change that around or run your own website. But it was much more about creating more than consuming and you're participating instead of just buying or just absorbing. And you just had these really special spaces where like you could be really good friends with somebody you'd never met before. It didn't matter whether they were male or female or trans or embodied or not, or a dog. <laughs> it didn't It didn't matter because it was about their brain. You were meeting their brain before you ever met their body. And that was the really cool thing about it. Now we've become not embodied, but a two-dimensional flattened representation template self 
of ourselves online. I wonder to a degree how we help the next generation navigate that. They have that question, am I normal? And the way in which they're trying to find the answer to that question is by looking at the individuals who they believe have a degree of normality in their life. But the reason that normality exists is that it, it removes all the stuff that's fuzzy. It homogenizes a form of identity that's good for consumption, but not good for collaboration or conversation. Yeah. If you think of normal, like a brand is normal because it's very well defined. All of the joy comes from the fuzziness. Like if you, if you look at the early movements of companies or art movements, it's just super fuzzy and people are playing around with ideas and what a thing is and what it isn't. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, but it's playful. And that's what I like about VR. I like to take people into the simulation where like you can be in an office cubicle and you can be a food prep person or you can be in a convenience store because the first thing that a lot of people do is they just throw everything because you can't do that anymore after a certain age. That's considered violent, you know, but as a kid, you can throw everything because it, it doesn't matter. And so you get this childlike behavior again of, hey, look, you can change your reality. We can't change our reality on web anymore because it's about template itself. And even getting into building a website is really gargantuan effort. Now there's a new thing called NeoCities, which is a new version of GeoCities, where you can just make HTML, CSS website really fast. Um, but a lot of it's like, oh, you need a group of 20 people to run a server-side application, and then everybody's going to use it, and you have to scale it up. Like, what about running something on your own server? Like, I ran a really bad PHP BB forum, and if, if somebody was being a jerk on it, I could ban them. But it was a small enough community that if somebody was being obnoxious, I had control over it. And now the the communities have scaled so much that reporting somebody or getting somebody banned is no longer within the user control. And so we have these interfaces made for us by other people that we subscribe to and they're free and they're ad sponsored. And we, we just, the control keeps going further and further away from us as individuals versus I thought that we were going to go into a world where anybody could be a web developer with a one click install of some PHP mechanism, make your own forum and choose whatever way you wanted to participate in the web. And now we have like five ways to participate in the web. Either you binge on Netflix, which is very unhealthy, or you go on Reddit or Hacker News or Twitter or Facebook and you make yourself 512 by 512 pixel with your interests and your real name. And then that's it. To a degree, you're looking to solve some of the issues that we've been talking about through this thing called Calm Tech. What is Calm Tech? So Calm Technology is the idea that the scarce resource in the 21st century is not technology, it's our attention. And how technology takes advantage or not of our attention is something that we can change. So there's two sides. One, companies that make devices or products that are like what we would use in, in a, the world of the desktop that take all of our attention are really obnoxious. And also the way that we use our own attention. Like we should be able to, to just have these things in our life that aren't taking over all of our time. Um, so the, the idea of calm technology came from Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown, who were researchers at Xerox Park in the nineties. And they created a future in which everything was connected. They had a whole internet of things future. Mark Weiser coined the term ubiquitous computing. And they realized that, oh my gosh, everything was just beeping at them. How do we make things work in an environment in a nice way, seamlessly with us? How do we have technology take the least amount of our attention and only when necessary? How do we make visible what was formerly invisible so that we have ambient awareness of things in our environment and we can act on things without having them take all of our attention? How do we compress information from our primary high resolution focus into secondary and tertiary focus, which is like haptics or sense of touch, you know, using the principle of synesthesia. I really like the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner because when it's done cleaning, it goes dun da da da, And when it's, it's stuck, it goes dun dun. But you can tell what that means because it's just a tone. It doesn't have to be this disembodied human voice telling you what's going on. Um, there's these light, this light faucet that has LEDs in it that actually shows you the temperature of the water through color. My co-founder and I made an ambient light bulb that was connected to a weather report that would show the color of the weather that it was going to be for the day. So if it was sunny, it was yellow. If it was rainy, it was blue. And you didn't have to have this weird computerized voice tell you, hello, Dave, here's the weather report. Is ComTech a way of technology talking back to us that isn't vocal, is more a visual form of communication and relationship with your faucet, which doesn't feel forced? Sometimes the visual channel is useful. Sometimes the auditory channel is useful. It, it really depends on what it is. 
like the record light on the video camera. That tells both you and the person you're recording that it's recording. It's a really calm tech. Street lights are really calm tech. Imagine building street lights today. Wouldn't you have to connect your car to them by Bluetooth or something? And they have this really inelegant display and they give you a counter for how long it would take for you. It would be awful. You just feel what the light is and you go through. Like you can use your secondary attention. You can use your peripheral attention to understand when you need to go or not and pay attention to the road. The whole point of a car is to keep your primary focus on the road and use your secondary and tertiary senses to control it. The lever on the floor, the pedal, is your tertiary sense. It's just a sense of touch. Doug Engelbart, when he created the mouse, actually had a thing under the table where you could click with your foot. <laughs> you would use more of yourself, right? And so a lot of these weird different ways of interacting, they just went by the wayside and we have this persistent technology of here's the mouse and here's what this looks like and here's what, you know, and, and people forget that like we're just in a generation of the web where things are really corporate and very templated and things can change, you know, but we just need to be okay with making weirder stuff and looking at alternative methods. And my number one thing is go back in time, find out what people did in the past, because it's really cyclical. People will make the exact same mistakes. But 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were all these amazing movements about like how technology could augment our capabilities and I'll look at things like hypercard. Somebody re needs to remake hypercard. Like there's all these cool things that can be remade that offer us a more augmented perspective on the world with our technology and empowers us and makes us superhuman instead of takes up all of our time and makes us feel depressed because we're endlessly clicking and and our brain is bent over and we just really need to to take a nap for 20 minutes. Is Comtech as a field a way to make sure that IoT doesn't become as noisy and as complicated and as unsatisfying as interfacing with the web through a screen, through a shiny glowing rectangle? Yeah, that's right. And I would suggest going to calmtech.com and reading some of the original papers by Mark Reiser. One of the papers is called The World is Not a Desktop. Why do we keep designing for the world as if we had unlimited attention and bandwidth and battery life? Because we don't. So why don't we make technology work well when it fails? If an escalator turns into stairs when it's broken, why, why can't we have things have offline first support? You know, how many things actually work on your phone when you turn into airplane mode? Do we need all of these things? No. Do they really enhance our life? Some of them, but we need to take a hard look at it and say, if we're going to entrust ourselves to an algorithm written by an arbitrary group of people that haven't really tested it out in the real world, and that algorithm puts our life in the algorithm's hands and we can't even see inside that black box, where are we as a culture? Are we going to be back in the dark ages where we don't know how to, to measure something because we've lost the mathematics, where we look at the source code as wizardry and very few people understand how to, how to change it because there's like one COBOL developer left and we study the code as ancient history and there are so many dependencies that we can't actually fix any of the stuff. And so we have entire parts of the grid that don't work anymore because we've said, well, it's got to be proprietary and we got to hide it and we can't document it because the person who wrote it in the newest programming language left before they documented documented anything. And now we have no believers in this magical programming language that was only around for two months because it was the hippest thing to do. Yeah. I hope, not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we don't get a dystopian kitchen of the future in which everything is dependent on everything else. It all sucks all of the Bluetooth. You can't connect to more than one thing at a time. You have a fingerprint sensor in your fridge that you can't use because your fingers are dirty because you're actually making something and it locks you out uh, of eating any of the sweets, but your friend is diabetic. And you need to get into the fridge, but you need a file support ticket to get into the fridge to add an extra user. Consumer protection aside, you should try to not purchase things that when they fail, you're stuck. A lot of products are developed for the optimal use case. They're developed in San Francisco where there's plenty of bandwidth and where your phone is always charged apparently. And of course, uh, there's, there's one story, I think it was on NPR where this guy said, oh, I want to automate the ticket system in the BART station in the, in the San Francisco transit system. And the podcast host said, can you tell that to the person downstairs at the information booth, the station? And the guy was like, sure. So they walked downstairs and he said, hi, I want to automate you. And the woman looks at him and just laughs and says, are, are, you, are you serious? You really think you can automate me? He says, yes, everything should be on your phone and you can just tap your phone and go through. 
And she said, that's great. And she says, excuse me, I need to help this couple. The couple comes up and they barely speak any English and she's helping them out with a physical subway map. And another person comes up, oh my gosh, I had a ticket, but my phone ran out of batteries and I need to get out of the gate. Or my credit card doesn't work in the machine. Can I pay here with cash? You know, all of these edge cases, because maybe the world on the computer is perfect. And maybe when you're going to websites, you can get all these clicks and everything works. But the real world has suboptimal situations. And I think a calm technology assumes that everything's suboptimal to begin with. A tree in the real world doesn't grow particularly straight. If it does, it's scary looking. You don't want a perfect fractal, rhizomatic fractal to grow out of the ground. It's terrifying. You know, you want the gnarly knotted stuff. That's what creates beauty. So if we say things are going to fail, how do we make something work all the time? Well, a paper ticket's pretty useful. What are some of the best examples that you've seen of calm tech? Where are we getting it right? You described some wonderful examples of where we're getting it desperately wrong, but where are we getting it right? Examples of calm technology. On my house, I have a slodge lock. It's really nice because it just has a pin code. And then I have different pin codes for like different friends and things like that. I can just type in the pin code. I don't need to have a phone and I can press a button. It lights up the pin code and then I can press the keys And the battery lasts, it's just a physical battery, it lasts for like two years. And it will tell you when the battery is going to go dead, but you still get like 50 keypad presses before you actually have to change the battery. It's amazing. That thing is so cool because I don't have to carry my key with me and I don't have to worry about being locked out. So I can just get home late, but I don't have a key and my phone is out of batteries. I punch the code. I'm done. That's so nice. And then if I need to have somebody come over to my house and like water my plants, here's their key code. And then I can change the key code after they're gone. And it's really good. So I like that sort of technology. It's just, it's really straightforward. I do like South Korean washers and dryers. They have a lot of complicated features, but when they're done, they sing. Uh, It's like, da, 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 da. It's like a happy appliance. I like the Zorushi rice cooker. That also has like a little tune. You know, kids love that thing because like the thing is done. I grew up with like these singing rice cookers, you know, my, my, my parents' friends were from Japan. So of course they bring us rice cookers and like that thing was done. I'd be like, mom, the thing is done. This is cool. So is there a difference between how this stuff is designed, say in the West and designed in the East? Well, in South Korea, I think there's a lot of celebration of technology. The idea that like two generations removed from an agrarian society and this, you know, you want to show off your appliances. It's the crowning achievement of the culture. It's like, wow, we're high tech. This is great. In Japan, there's a lot of automation happening because employees are expensive. And so you have, you just have these little vending machines on the street corners because you can't afford the square feet and the people to host, you know, a little bodega. So you've got that, you have automated robots and you have ticket machines for ramen. Instead of having a waiter, you just press the button of what you want, get the ticket slided under the counter, get your ramen from a cook, right? So there's a lot of automation in that sense, just because of the expense. Um, The Paro Robotic Seal, I love. It is for dementia patients. It's just in the shape of a seal. So you don't have the uncanny valley of a fake robotic dog or cat, which is going to just seem really weird, or a human. A seal, not that many people hang out with seals in real life. And so you don't have as much uncanny valley when it just looks like a cute stuffed animal that doesn't have to walk. It just has like some flippers and tail. And so it takes the dementia patient's minds off of what they're going through and they can pet it. And you don't have to worry about like feeding or watering it. And it just lasts for a really long time. So there's some cute things <laughs> that are showing up. That, I like, think that's a great example because everybody goes, oh, that, that para robot is artificial intelligence. No. The actual fact is <laughs> artificial life. It, it has just very few cues that make you feel like it is artificially alive insofar as it breathes. It has a degree of warmth. It's furry. It blinks. It does these very small things that are enough to trick the brain into believing. That's the ultimate key for this stuff. It's reactive technology and not proactive. The minimum amount of these like little symbols and the brain does the rest. We already live in a, in a virtual reality since we had the imagination of people. That was a virtual reality. Religion's a virtual reality. Education's a virtual reality. Language is a virtual reality. Everything's a virtual reality. Facebook is a two-dimensional virtual reality that we believe in and we use. And it's flat. And a lot of a lot of the idea is we think when we're on it. We imagine all these different futures and scenarios. And that's the thing. Like We don't need that much. The two-dimensional interface of a book and those words are so powerful that we imagine a virtual reality in our heads and can like somebody in a book 
and even know them more than we know our next door neighbor, right? It, it affords this like inner thing. And the complexity of a book is amazing because you close it and all that complexity is encased within this interface and it's just a little spine. There used to be a, a LucasArts a researcher, I, I think he was a researcher, a senior manager at LucasArts, who used to go around and give this presentation about this terrible thing that's happening across America where young children are going up to their rooms and they're spending hours inside of these things called books and they're creating these virtual reality environments between their ears and we're not seeing them for days as they turn these things called pages. And he was equating the, the fear we have of kids spending all this time in, in computer game environments to spending time in books. Yeah, I mean, a newspaper is a virtual reality. And if you read that on the train and then you talk to somebody about it, then you're just discussing the virtual reality game that you're just a part of. I think I think the key to this is remembering that sometimes when you make something as a joke or art, like there are all these companies that are like, we're going to hire developers to test out our software. It's like, no, you should get artists in here. <laughs> or oh, kids. I used to say to AR developers, you need to have a child in residence. I think technically illegal, but if you had this child in residence, they would just run through, test all your demos and go, you know what? If it doesn't work in the first five seconds, broken, broken, move on to the next thing, throw it away, broken. And I think there's something in that ability to have an intuitive response with a piece of technology. Absolutely. And there's the attention span. And so I, I like putting kids in VR, like good VR demos because they know exactly what to do because they're used to reality is not entirely defined yet. And I think we need to have these zones of play. So, you know, the story of Eliza chatbot, right? In the sixties, Joseph Weizenbaum was saying artificial intelligence. Ha ha ha. This is funny. I'm going to show you just how, how, how shitty this system is. I will make a chatbot. and I'm just going to put all the stereotypes in of what psychologists say. I'll make Eliza the psychology chatbot. And then I think his secretary was sitting there on it and she was like, this is great. It doesn't judge me. It allows me to get in a feedback loop with myself and understand more about what I'm experiencing because it wasn't trying to be perfect. There's no such thing as perfect technology. That's assuming that there's perfect humans. At some point, technology will be able to understand us completely. Yeah, right. We don't even understand each other completely, not to mention all the different languages that we speak. Who's going to understand that? That doesn't matter. What matters is saying, this stuff sucks, just like humans do, and understanding everything. So let's work with that and make it silly and have artists tear apart our tech demos and kids tear apart our tech demos instead of people who are going to reinforce the blandness of the thing that we just built and make it so serious. You know, it's like the Microsofting of everything. It's like, do you know where Microsoft came from? Bill Gates was like drunk and hanging out in New Mexico and like breaking into like weird uh, equipment at night and like driving it around. If you have a new thing like VR, there should be far more arts fellowships and sponsorships to just do whatever you want with it and break it. Because if they're going to find a glitch, they'll find a way to aestheticize that and make fun of it and write an essay about it. And when I was in the geotech world, I was reading Mary Flanagan's book, Critical Play, which was all about these like geolocative movements and moments. And I saw Dennis Crowley and all these different people's game on Pac Manhattan. And I, I was inspired to rebuild these things. It was this exciting thing of that's that cultural stuff that a lot of the tech is missing. And when we just say, oh, only tech people can build this and let's slap some user experience on, and then it's just to serve ad revenue, you miss out on all the amazing opportunities that you can do to get people to, to work together and be together. And you lose the opportunity of, of, you know, really helping to empower people. And it's sad that like the idea of personal empowerment is now like a soft term. Well, that's not efficient. Well, da, 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 da. it's like eventually when the snake eats its tail and everything's so efficient, then what do we do? What happens when somebody sells their company for 20 or 30 or $40 million? Usually what I see is like they, build, they buy a bunch of synthesizers or like they go on a one year road trip and they're like, wow, now I'm level 99. Oh my gosh, what have I done? And they like try to get themselves back into a real movement or people burn out in tech and they go to pasture. Like they literally go to a farm and they say, I'm going to work with the code from the earth, you know, animals and vegetables and minerals, and I'm going to build stuff and be reassociated with like the sunrise and the sunset, you know, because it's only so long we can do this before we say, what is the meaning of life? And what are we doing in this, in this environment, which we say like, we're separate from nature. Like, no, we are nature and that's fine. Eventually we need to remember that all this stuff comes out of the ground that we have to eat. <laughs> And there's stuff in the environment that like that we experience and people get older. And if the world is only going to be great for people who are 15 to 20 years old, like get me off this planet because there's a lot more like getting old and 
raising kids and hanging out with friends, all of this Kairos time that people are like, okay, I'm in my condo in San Francisco and I'm clicking the buttons to get everything delivered so that I don't know anybody in my neighborhood down the street, even though I live two blocks from the mission and there are awesome burritos. Like, and then I'm going to go and pay 3k to go down to South America for an ayahuasca ritual to try and get some meaning back in my life because I have taken that meaning and, and externalized it and put it somewhere else, you know? It's, it's not the like Silicon Valley of the, the crazy dot com boom where like everybody's into techno music and had fun and party. It's like these people in these tiny containment pods and it just reminds me of worker bees. So how do we get to the point where suddenly technologists felt that the human condition was a problem that needed to be solved? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, it's like, oh, humans need to be solved. Death needs to be solved, all of these things. And on the one hand, heck yeah, I want some of my professors and teachers to live forever because they're awesome. You know, I, I, I don't think, you know, and some of the people are like, I want to live. Some of those professors would not want to live forever. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> some, some of them are like, just get me off this planet. <laughs> there's a kind of meaning to life when you know that there's not enough of it and you panic and you say, oh my gosh, I haven't done enough yet and I haven't experienced enough yet, you know, and it's not just going to another country and consuming the culture, which looks the same as everywhere now because everybody buys the same stuff. But it's about these nuanced moments that are incalculable. It's about trying to master things that are unmastered, like things like how far can you push ceramics? Well, that's not masterable. Can anyone really master the piano and all the permutations of those keys? What about the violin what about painting what about singing what about dance like there's all of these soft architectures so to speak that can't be fully consumed or automated or programmed and when you see shows like star trek you have on on the earth everything is is kind of maintained you know you have vineyards you know with, with Jean-Luc Picard his family still doing vineyards you know and you have all the tech up in space but there's this preservation of these cultures these unique items that you know, culture comes from geography, mostly geographical base. Like now that we can have strawberries any time of year in the supermarket, there's no reason to celebrate strawberry season anymore. So part of it's going to need to go back to like local environments and celebrating the geographical distance and what that means and, and the uniqueness of where people are from. And another part is just saying like, uh, we need support for people who are, you know, above 35 and no longer to, able to be employed in tech. And we need to have meaning for people that are older. And we need to go back to a balance where you can participate at lots of different levels and there's purpose and meaning at all these different levels. And people can have a long, fulfilling life if they want to and feel like they did something that the things that are valued aren't just glorified plumbing, like programming, where you're just dealing with somebody else's mess that's poorly documented and that's in a rush because some some corporate executive is breathing down your neck and you have tons of code debt and you don't even know the language that you're in because you have to learn the new language. Uh, I would, I would really like to see um, the ability to make like structures that last for more than a couple of years. I don't have to upgrade my phone all the time. I want the next version of the operating system I download to be smaller than the last one. I don't want everything to be connected like PetNet style, where it's like this automated pet feeder that was server based and the servers went down and all, all the pets got stranded. Like I want there to be just a little bit more thought put in the products around me. And I find it funny that when people get enough money, you know, they buy mid-century modern teak furniture from Denmark because they want the handmade, they want the long lasting and they want real objects made out of real stuff. So no matter how much we get automated, there's, there's more and more of this need to have like nature and reality come back into our lives. And the more saturated people get in tech, the less they want their kids to use tech and the more they want to just go on, live on a farm, you know? So I think at some point we'll something will happen. There's only so long that wealth can be ridiculously consolidated and only so much meaning we can extract before people say, oh man, I'm really sick of this. Like I want to go make music and I want to be bad at what I do and I want to be an amateur and I want to explore and it's okay not to be perfect. And I'm going to share it with these weird groups of people. And I don't care what they look like. And if their skin is tanned and if they're wearing the right clothes because they like me unconditionally and that's fine. And we can all be awkward together. You know, that's where the great stuff comes from. It's just hard to find those groups anymore because everybody's like, oh, it needs to be perfect, you know? Thank you to Amber for sharing her thoughts on how we might design technology that respects our attention. 
You can find out more by purchasing Amber's new book, Calm Technology, Principles and Patterns for Non-Intrusive Design, available now. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.